And um, as I mentioned today, we are going to be talking about heuristic analysis. Now, heuristic analysis is a very cool process that I believe every single website should perform. Everyone, whether you are just getting started with a website or you have a website that's alive, live and kicking, or you have a new product that you're launching, whatever it is, heuristic analysis can be an amazing way for you to discover various things that we'll get into in just a moment. And it's also a great thing to do um, when you don't have resources to do other things. So let's get started. So what is the purpose of heuristic evaluation? So a heuristic evaluation or heuristic analysis is a process used to discover usability problems in any application or website. The way it works is that one or more experts, normally between three to five, that's my number that I like to use, uh, so between three to five experts work on evaluating the website against a set of principles and heuristics. The entire process is designed to help uncover hidden opportunities on your website, find obstacles that need fixing, and prioritize your optimization stuff. Now, you can run a heuristic analysis on your website at any stage, whether you just have sketches and wireframes or if you have a full blown site that needs optimizing. So let's talk a bit about the purpose of it. So on one, on one thing, it's discovering usability issues. Um, heuristic evaluation is great at that, just finding those problematic issues that you have on the page. It uncovers hidden opportunities, it finds obstacles and key roadblocks preventing users from performing tasks on your page, and it helps you prioritize your optimization stuff. So before we get started and talk about how you can actually perform a heuristic analysis, I definitely want to highlight the pros and the cons of running a heuristic analysis because there are many different sides to it. So let's talk about the pros. Now, number one, the process requires a limited budget. So you'll need about three to five UX experts to run the analysis, but that's it. You don't need huge tools. You don't need to spend a ton of money. It really is on a limited budget. So if you don't have a ton of money to spend now on new tools and research and um, employees or whatever the process is, then a heuristic analysis is a great thing for you. The other thing is that if you do it correctly, you can get a heuristic analysis done within a few hours. So that's another thing that's really cool because um, many times a lot of these optimization processes take a ton of time to perform uh, and it takes a long time to get results. So heuristic analysis or heuristic evaluation can actually be done in a few hours. So that's a cool thing. Now, if you're working on a new launch of a product or a feature, you can run a heuristic test before people even interact with it. So that's really cool because then you're actually going to discover a lot of issues you may have before people get to use it and complain or have issues or have problems performing certain tasks. So it's a great way to do something before you launch. Now, it's also relatively simple to repeat this process every time you want to optimize a part of your funnel, launch a new product, or evaluate something else in your customer journey. So it's very different than running an A-B test that normally would be only set up once and you run it for a certain amount of time um, and it takes a long time to get to. Um, heuristic analysis or heuristic evaluation um, really can be repeated many times. And lastly, it is very helpful for low traffic sites. So if you don't have much traffic or monthly conversions to run an A-B test, now in order to run an A-B test, you will need at least 300 conversions a month on your website. It's not that you can't run an A-B test without it, but if you have less than 300 conversions of the same conversion, so I'm not meant, I'm not, I don't mean, um, signups and downloads and purchases. I'm, I'm saying 
300 purchases a month or 300 signups or 300 downloads a month, it will take you a very long time. Sometimes it can take six months or longer to run an A-B test if you don't have that um, enough traffic or uh, enough numbers, enough conversions a month. So running a heuristic evaluation can fast track that process for you and help you find the immediate things that can be changed and optimized without running a test. So these are all the cool things and the, pro, uh, the pros of running a heuristic analysis. However, there are also some cons to it. So there's a few things that aren't that good. So as we discussed last month uh, during uh, February on our Persuasion and Psychology Month, we are prone to different cognitive biases. This, this actually means that our personal opinions, our emotions and biases actually alter the results of the test. So that's actually why when you do a heuristic analysis, you do it with a few people at the same time. So um, there's a few other options in order to avoid, um, to avoid biases and we'll get into them, but you can compare it with heat maps, recordings, usability testings, user testings, or even confirm it with your Google Analytics data. But that is one of the things that you really need to watch out for, um, your cognitive biases or the biases that you just have emotionally towards certain designs and certain products or certain features. So when you're doing a heuristic analysis, it is important to have more than one person do it. The other thing is that you require an expert. So a UI or UX expert who can truly evaluate a site from a professional point of view. Now, maybe you have someone on the team, perfect. But if you don't, then it might be a little hard to find someone. It's not impossible, but it is something that you have to spend some time um, and money on. Now, contrary to A-B testing, a heuristic analysis is done privately without the involvement of your target audience. Now, this actually can lead to some wrong assumptions and incorrect evaluation. So that's why, again, um, heuristic analysis is always done along with other uh, elements. It's never um, done alone and just um, kind of uh, depended on. You always have to do more research in order to validate all this stuff. Um, but you do have to remember that as opposed to A-B testing, it's only you and your experts looking at the page. It's not real users interacting with it. And lastly, Due to all these disadvantages, the a heuristic analysis cannot be performed in a silo. So it's, as I said, it's never enough. Um, you know, after completing a heuristic analysis, I always follow up with, as I said before, user testing, on-site survey, customer surveys, or other methods to verify what we found. So it's just a, a reminder that while um, heuristic analysis is important and a very, very good tool, never use it in isolation. And remember that you are prone to biases. Now that we've covered the basics of what a heuristic analysis is and the different pros and cons of it, I want to talk about how to conduct a meaningful and optimized heuristic analysis that delivers the insights that you need to optimize your websites. So there are many different metrics and rules you can follow when you're performing a heuristic analysis on your site, but the most famous and common one is Jacob Nielsen's principles. So there's a list of, of different um, experts here that you can follow. Um, you can easily Google these names or you can, we'll link to them um, in the recording of this session, but each one of them uh, basically kind of breaks down the, breaks down the principles that they use to analyze a website. The most famous one is, as I mentioned, is Jacob Nielsen's 10 usability principles. It's the most used uh, for evaluation, and I strongly suggest using those if you're just getting started. You can really just count on these 10 and you'll be good to go. You don't have to use all the rest. Um, so let's review what his usability principles are. And what I mean by that is that when he's looking at a website, he's evaluating each website or product page according to these principles, rules, and uh, metrics. Okay, 
So number one is visibility. So the page should always keep people informed about their status. You must always be able to tell as a user what's happening. Now this allows people to feel in control, to take appropriate actions, to reach their goal, and ultimately to trust the brand. So that's number one, visibility. Number two, mapping. So essentially for Jacob Nielsen, mapping means using the, word of, the words of your audience. The website or the product should always speak the audience languages, um, the audience's language with words, phrases, and concepts familiar to the user. So actually to do that, you will need to run different surveys on your website to do some interviews and really get to know the language that people use. But what Jacob, uh, what Nilsson says is use those words. Don't make up your own jargon. Don't try and invent the wheel. Use your customer's words. Number three is freedom. So the idea is that you provide good defaults and options to undo your previous action. So people always make mistakes on a website or take the wrong path in your journey. So um, freedom means allowing them to easily return to the previous state and rethink their steps. So a back button, for example, or having breadcrumbs and being able to click on the previous breadcrumb in order to go back. So just allowing that freedom of, of navigating freely from one step to the next. Number four, consistency. So your product and your website should always use the same interface and layout on all pages. People should not have to wonder whether certain words or actions mean something else. And I've seen this constantly on various websites in various areas where you have different uh, designs on different pages, different fonts, different colors, um, call to action buttons suddenly appear in different colors. And all this um, is problematic. So you want to stay consistent with your design. Number five error prevention. So does your website help people avoid making mistakes? Um, your website should eliminate all the screens, actions, or the words that may cause people to error um, or misunderstand what's going on. So if possible, give people the option to confirm a certain action. So are you sure you want to leave this screen? Um, make sure that when you, uh, you know that when you leave this screen or if you log out, your, this information will not be saved. So the idea is to constantly give people the option to prevent the errors they're about to take. Number six, recognition. So the idea is to minimize the cognitive load that people have. They need to remember what to do next. People should not have to remember information on their own, and you should make sure that you're providing clear instructions. Number seven is flexibility. Make sure that different tasks and actions on your site are easy to perform for both beginners and for novice users. And this is key for really getting um, a good customer journey. Number eight, minimalism. So provide only the most necessary information on a page in the most elegant way. So the idea is to remove friction. And don't worry, I'm going to be getting into many different examples and I'm going to walk you through every single step and how to do it in just a moment. Number, my, number nine is error recovery. So essentially you're helping users um, recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. The errors we make in a form, for example, should be clearly indicated and explained. So the idea is that when you're filling out a form and you make a mistake, don't expect people to just understand that they made a mistake, but really tell them what that is and what mistake they made and how they can fix it. So it's just a lot of the things here, as you can see, are about errors, about helping people move backwards and forwards, helping people prevent errors or helping people recover from these errors that they've made. And lastly, making sure that the user can find all the information that they need to perform certain tasks. Now, this could be done with a help center, um, with a ton of resources and a knowledge base, or it could just be done with tool tips or pop-ups. Uh, but the idea 
is that these are Jacob Nelson's 10 basic principles for a heuristic evaluation. So make sure that you check out the complete guide and I'm going to uh, shoot that here. Let me just get that link for you because um, there you go. Make sure later on to check out the complete guide. He really walks you through every single one of these steps and heuristics and tells you how to notice them, how to recognize these issues and how to fix them. But I would like to really get practical um, and I want to talk about where you can start and how to actually run your own heuristic analysis. So first things first, you have to reach a few goals. So your idea is that each time you perform a heuristic analysis, your goals are to, number one, oops, <laughs> um, provide clarity. So that's one of the things that you will be doing while you are um, analyzing a website and performing a heuristic analysis. Your goal is to clarify the website, provide more clarity. So remove any concerns, um, roadblocks or confusing elements and language from your customer journey. That's one of the goals of a heuristic heuristic analysis to remove all of these issues so people should know exactly what their next action should be um, and be able to quickly find the answers to their questions. So here are a few questions that you can ask yourself while you are looking at a page. So if you are now reviewing a website or you're reviewing a pricing page or a landing page, there are a few questions you can ask yourself that, that will help you understand if the page that you're looking at provides clarity or not. So can people tell within five seconds of landing on your page what you provide and what the value is? Is it clear what page they are on and what actions they can perform on the page? And does the visual hierarchy on the page, uh, both the copy and the images, help the user? Can people clearly identify what their next step in the processes. Those are the three questions you want to ask yourself on every page when you're doing a heuristic analysis. Number two is relevancy. So goal number two is ensuring that the page is relevant. People should always feel um, that they are in the right place and in the right direction of achieving their goals. The information that they receive on each page should be only relevant to the page that they are on and the next steps um, should be very clear. So that means that it's also relevant. So um, here's a few questions you can be asking yourself when you are doing that heuristic analysis. Does the landing page match the site, ad or messaging people came from in terms of design and language? Is the right information, the information they need to make a decision, provided on the page without needing to navigate to another one? Now, this is actually one that most websites um, do fall on, number two, where you send people to an additional page to read more when there's not really any need to, and you could be providing that information on the first page. Does your copy match the target audience's language? Does it match the words in the user's head when they think of your product or their problem? And lastly, do the images you use on the page reflect both the value and the relevancy to the solution they're searching for? Do they serve as clarification and visual aids to drive your point home? So these are four questions when you're reviewing your page and you're trying to reach goal number two, which is relevancy, you want to ask yourselves these four questions. Your goal, goal number three is removing friction. So the heuristic analysis process basically helps identify elements on your website that create friction. Your goal is to find these friction points and remove them. So a few questions you can ask yourself while you're reviewing a website is um, reviewing your research. Are there, so first thing basically is going back to any surveys that you've done, polls, interviews, 
um, anything where you've really done some customer research and ask yourself, are there any concerns, roadblocks, or challenges that, that were mentioned by your audience that aren't addressed on the page? The people need to perform many steps to get the information they need or perform an action. Is there any information about your solution that's missing on the page? And are there any usability issues like um, the speed of the site, form fields that are not working, specific actions that can't be performed on mobile, or maybe difficulty reading the copy on the page due to contrast or font size and stuff like that. So these are specific questions that you can be asking yourself when you're trying to remove friction from the page. Now, goal number four is removing distractions. So any action or element on the page that isn't directly contributing to helping people achieve their desired goal is a distraction. Imagine trying to focus on a task at work and being constantly called, messaged, messaged um, emailed, and talked to. That's what most experiences on a website feel like, right? Um, so um, here are some questions that you can ask yourself. Um, number one, asking people to share your page on social media. So for some reason, um, we see this a lot on landing pages too, when people arrive on a landing page and for some reason, um, these websites have added a way to share um, on social media. That is a distraction that isn't called for. Are you offering additional products before um, it has been, you know, before one has been chosen, there's an E missing there, before one has been chosen. Um, do you have too many options to choose from? Um, reminder, we spoke, I think it was last week, about analysis paralysis, um, a cognitive bias that um, basically determines that when we have too many options, our brains opt out. Do you have too many options to choose from? Number four, do you have any unrelated animations, images, or banners that distract people? Do you have any relevant information on the page that doesn't contribute in any way? Or do you have any irrelevant pop-ups on your page? Now, these are just some of the questions that you can ask when you're approaching a heuristic analysis, but they're a great place to start with and they can set you in the right direction. So we spoke about four goals of a heuristic analysis and the different questions that you can ask yourself. Now, let's talk about what you should be evaluating during your analysis. So how to actually do a heuristic analysis. So there's a few things you want to be looking at. Number one is functionality. So you want to be identifying friction points, menus and navigation. You want to be looking at the clarity and consistency. Um, that's with functionality. You want to be looking at the content, so persuasive content on each page. Clarity and readability, motivation and persuasion, category um, and lister pages. You want to be looking at the layout and the design, the style, the information hierarchy, the usability and the graphics. So these are all the things that we want to be looking at um, and evaluating while we are uh, doing a heuristic analysis. Lastly, conversion points. So uh, essentially the place where the conversion happens. This can be on a checkout page, pricing page, um, wherever the conversion is, maybe it's a subscription page. Um, we want to be evaluating the customer journey, the conversion pages and forms, and post conversions. So essentially we want to be talking about thank you pages and stuff like that. But let me dive into each one. So when we talk about function, uh, functionality of a website, you want to ask yourself specific questions like, can people navigate and reach their goals in the easiest and most efficient way possible? Does the main navigation indicate where people are in their customer journey and their process? Are there, you know, are the major sections of the site available from every page? So that means like, is your navigation actually working well? Is it included? Does it include the most important uh, sections of the site? And um, can people perform the same actions on mobile easily? That's functionality. And do instructions and messages appear 
on the same place on each page. So when you get to um, the stage where you are evaluating the functionality of the page, these are some of the questions you should be asking yourself. When you get to content, there are a few questions you should be asking yourself too. Now, I'm not just talking about blog posts. I'm talking about the whole content of each of your pages. So if you're doing a website heuristic analysis, every page you review, you should look at it from a functionality point and the content on the page. So does the website, does the page communi communicate effectively, efficiently, and persuasively? Are the words, phrases, and language used on the site familiar to an average user? So I think I gave this example a couple of weeks ago. I was showing a, um, a screenshot of Zoom. They had their bullet points there, and some of their bullet points include all these really weird letters and words that I had no idea what they meant, and they were very confusing. So when you're looking at your page, are you using words and language that are familiar to an average user? Are the language and tone of voice consistent across channels and messages? Are formatting elements like bullet points, bolding, uh, paragraph spacing, are they used where, where it's possible to simplify reading? Are call to action buttons and links descriptive and motivational? And lastly, is social proof clearly displayed and used to solve um, objections and concerns? So when you're looking at pages that have lots of content on them or even a landing page or if you're evaluating a pricing page or whatever that page is, these are the questions you want to ask yourself regarding the content. Then we reach design and layout. So you're looking at a page and you should be asking yourself, does the website appear clear, easy and intuitive to use? Are the pages quick to scan? So can people actually skim it? Clear headings, subheadings, and short paragraphs. Is there a clear visual starting point to every page? Does each page on the site share a consistent layout? Um, unfortunately, many websites don't. And is the copy easy to read? The font size, contrast, colorways, all of this stuff. Um, does it work? Um, in terms of um, in terms of easy to read and readability, uh, Debbie says, "What do you mean by visual starting point?" So, what I mean by that is, when someone lands on the page, is it completely clear to them where they should start their uh, evaluation, where they should start reading? Many times, you'll see huge blocks of text, one next to each other, no white space. Everything's the same color. Everything's the same font, and it's really hard to understand where we should even start. Now, it's not just the reading uh, element, it's the whole hierarchy of information. So is it clear what you need to do, how you need to read the page, what you need to click on, where you need to scroll to? If you have any, um, I don't know, maybe um, animations on the page or things that people can play around with, is it clear? So do people really understand where they start and where the page, the page ends? Um, so those are the questions about design and layout. Hopefully that was helpful, um, Debbie. And if not, then I'm happy to clarify. Um, lastly, uh, we'll be looking at conversion points. So um, conversion points are those pages um, that people convert on. So the questions you might want to ask yourself are, um, after people select a relevant CTA, is it visually shown that they've accomplished the task? After people complete an action, do they get a thank you page? Um, are any additional costs like shipping communicated clearly throughout the user journey? Is there a clear path, uh, path into checkout, the payment page, or contact page? Are people shown the different stages in the checkout uh, from start to end? And are relevant trust symbols, icons, quotes provided to increase trust during the conversion? So these are some of the questions you want to be asking yourself when you're reviewing conversion pages. 
Um, Debbie says, do you need to repeat page title at beginning of page, e.g. services page should say services we provide, or can you put more persuasive copy there? You can definitely put more persuasive copy in there. Um, it's, you know, what matters is the value proposition as Todd mentions here um, very kindly. Um, what really matters is the, is the uh, value proposition, but you do want to have additional um, content that supports that claim. So when you talk about uh, content or design and layout, the whole, what's important is just making sure that when people are looking at your page, they understand where they start, they understand where it finishes, and they have a clear reason to actually reading on. So, okay. How do you actually prioritize your heuristic analysis? So we went through um, the goals that a heuristic analysis has. Uh, we went through the different um, types of uh, things you should be looking at on each page. And let's say you've completed your heuristic analysis. And in a few slides, I'm going to share a spreadsheet that you can use that will make this much easier to consume. But Let's say you have gone through everything. You've written down all of your um, all of your answers, and not just you. Again, it's you and hopefully three or four other um, UX specialists who are going through the website and evaluating it. How do you prioritize what to actually fix and what to approach? So, essentially, what you want to do is grade it according to problem severity. So I actually suggest scaling the results that we've seen from one to four. So uh, one being a, a minor fix that can be done by a cosmetic change and isn't a burning change. Two requires a fix with low priority. Three means high priority. And four is that it's catastrophic and it needs to be immediately solved. So the way I actually um, grade them is according to the impact on users, the revenue for the business. So it's how does this impact the, the users and how does this impact the revenue of the, business, of the business? So for example, when I'm trying to grade a certain heuristic issue that I found, I'll ask myself, how common is the problem on the site? Is it an issue people can overcome on their own or does it demand a fix? Um, does it affect the main flow or journey of the website? Does it affect the bottom line? So does it have impact on measurable conversions? Um, how long will it take to fix? What resources are required? And what I mean by that is time, money, team, um, you know, the less uh, resources needed, the better the score. And what I do is I put together a very simple spreadsheet that you fill in. So here's a screenshot of it. Um, I will share the link to it. I think uh, Sophia has the link to it, so you can go ahead and open it right now if you didn't. Um, oh, here, I have it actually. <laughs> Here we go. So this is the spreadsheet that you can use. And the idea is that what you're doing is you're mentioning over here on the left, and hopefully you can see my mouse. Over here on the left, you are writing down what page you are on. So pricing page, landing page, about us page, whatever, sign up page. Then you're writing down the actual problem that you found. So examples that I gave here is, there is a minimum ba minimal balance between information density and the use of white space. Um, the header is intrusive and it takes up too much of the page. Or elements that aren't clickable look like they are. Or text links are not differ um, uh, differentiable from normal text. So this is the problem. Then I match it with the heuristic issue. So I go back to Jacob Nilsson's list and I find where does this fit in this issue? And then I rate it according to the severity. Is it major? Is it minor? Um, is it a quick fix or does it require an immediate fix? And how many people mentioned this? So if one person mentioned it, then maybe it's not that big of an issue. And again, if four experts or five experts mention that you can't differentiate between 
links and normal text and it requires immediate fix and it's also easy to do because you don't need design a design team and you don't need developers you just need someone to go in and fix that in terms of color then that gets a high priority so this is just a quick way to kind of um, evaluate everything, put everything in a spreadsheet, and it makes it so much easier to actually follow through and identify the most important elements that need to be fixed. So essentially, you've gone through your entire heuristic evaluation, you have put it in the spreadsheet, and you have prioritized what is the most important aspects um, that needs to be fixed. And you've graded them. So it looks like um, text links that you know look like normal um, text are the most important one. And then we have two more who are kind of major. And then we have one last one, which is minor. So then you can prioritize them. But next, you'll probably need to present this to your team or maybe to your clients, uh, to your manager. So to do that, you'll need to summarize all of your findings and present them in a way that highlights the most important elements and is also highly actionable because no one's going to want to look at the spreadsheet. It's like showing people graphs in Google Analytics. People just completely use you, lose you. So um, here's what I include in my presentation. Um, so when I'm presenting to a client, um, I do a keynote um, or PowerPoint uh, deck. And essentially what I include is the following, the process that I went through. So just a quick uh, review of who did it, um, how we performed it, what pages we looked at, and just kind of a, a, um, a quick brief just so people can understand how um, in depth this was and that it wasn't just someone making things up as they were going ahead. Um, the list of heuristics that we used. So if we use Jacob Nilsson's heuristics, then I will provide that list and I'll quickly run them through what um, each heuristic means. But just as a general note, just to say, you know, these are the principles. It um, really kind of puts in uh, the foundation of trust so they can see that it's built on uh, very specific metrics. And then uh, the major problems that we found. So essentially, what are the biggest issues that need fixing? Numbers and impact. So, okay, we're saying, we're saying that these two, uh, two, three, five problems are the biggest things that need fixing. So next, it's up to us to prove numbers and impact. So numbers means essentially how is this impacting us if you can go into google analytics and show that there's a big drop off if you can look at heat maps and say you know we can see that this is a consistent issue because we can see that people are clicking around here and they don't know what to do or we can see in, in recordings or we've interviewed people we've done user testing and they've all validated this then these are the numbers and the impact of what it could do when we change it and optimize it and of course, prioritization. So what are we going to do first? What are we going to do second? What are we going to do last? And the actual solutions that we're proposing. So if we know that we have a problem with the fact that text, that links look like regular text, then obviously the solution is quite easy. But there are many issues that we'll find that might be problematic and we need to come up with good ideas um, that will show our team or our clients that we have solutions and that they're not going to be too overwhelming. So they're not gonna to require too many resources to get them done. Um, Neha asks, who did it um, as in the expert names? So um, you, can, you can include the names of the people who run the heuristic analysis. I don't know if that's important. I mean, it depends again, if you are in-house or if you're doing it for a client. If you're doing it for a client, I wouldn't necessarily mention who the experts are. You are the expert that they hired and you can just say, we had three, four, five experts evaluate this page. It's not really any of their concern um, to know who they were. If you're in-house and it's a big company and you want to talk about the people and give credit to the people who did it, then of course you should mention their names. Um, but I don't know if it's that important of a thing, but you do need to say that experts 
reviewed the website and those are the people who did the heuristic analysis and not people that are just bystanders. Um, and that is it essentially. So you present your heuristic analysis to your team and you get started with the fixing. Now, this is really a quick overview of a heuristic analysis. And as you can see, there's a lot of different elements to it, right? I mean, there's all sorts of uh, rules or metrics that you can follow, but essentially a heuristic analysis, when you really look at it um, as the bottom line, it's all about asking the right questions. So first, choosing the page that you want to evaluate or the product or the funnel that you want to analyze and then making sure that you're full that you're reaching these goals of clarity of relevance of removing distractions of removing friction and then just keep asking yourself questions about the design about the functionality about the devices about the conversion pages about the content and the more questions you ask yourself about each page the better the better insights you're going to get and of course, as I said, that's when you cross-reference it with all of the rest of your research. Okay, so I am going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> and, whoops, go back on camera. Hey, I'm back. Um, and see if we have, and I see we have quite a few questions here in chat and in the Q&A box. Um, let me see. Okay. So David Taylor says, I'm working on a web and desktop application currently, bringing it to the early 2000s. No joke. Are there any differences um, that apply for desktop application versus web app that you would suggest that I keep in mind? So one thing that I didn't really mention much during uh, this slide deck or workshop is the whole idea of mobile. So I mentioned it, I think just once um, when I was talking about functionality, but what's really important when you are doing this heuristic analysis is to also do it on mobile. You can even open a new uh, spreadsheet um, just for mobile and keep asking yourself the same questions because many times, um, the things that we can do on desktop aren't necessarily that easy to do on mobile. And for some reason, even though the entire world, the entire world is mobile, we keep forgetting about it. So David, I would definitely suggest um, performing your heuristic analysis on both desktop and mobile. Um, Cause I think that would definitely uh, be very helpful and to very good to keep in mind that needs, it needs to be done. Um, Neha asks, does accessibility for visually or audibly impaired users become necessary in the near future? It seems that we do not give enough consideration to this aspect of UI and UX. That is such an important question. Um, you know, it really depends on the, unfortunately, it really depends on the country that you're in. Um, there are different laws in various countries that you have to provide accessibility um, to different people. So I know that in Israel, for example, there are very strict laws that you have to have a special um, kind of pop-up that allows people who have disabilities to actually choose the disability that they have, and that automatically changes the website to help them perform the actions that they need. So I think it's a very important question because that also is a very huge part of um, a heuristic analysis. And at the end of the day, our entire goal is to make sure that people have a good, consistent, and easy to use um, customer journey. So that's part of it. And I would definitely, definitely look into it. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Um, Todd asks, where do you find your experts? Well, um, that's a very good question. So if you're in-house, I would say that you would want to, you can reach out to people who are designers, UX experts in the company. However, 
remember we talked about biases. So many times um, people really do love their design or they don't want to admit that there's something wrong with their design. So it might be harder to get people from within the team to actually perform this in a unbiased way. So I would actually suggest trying to reach out to other people um, and, and kind of asking for their help. Now you can do this by reaching out to other companies who have UX designers and asking them for their help and then maybe providing it for them so you could swap between you. You can hire UX experts. There's so many um, around there um, that you can use. Um, so I definitely go about that. I try to avoid using people in-house just because of those biases and people don't really like to admit that things are wrong with their design. So that's what I would do. Joe says, post heuristic analysis, what services do you then offer? What more will you then do for the client? Okay, so here's the thing. A heuristic analysis in my process, in the emotional targeting framework, is part of my research. I'm not just doing a heuristic analysis. I'm running polls, I'm doing surveys, I'm looking into Google Analytics, I'm looking into um, all sorts of sheets of data and Google Tag Manager, and I'm doing interviews, and I'm doing voice of customer research. So we're doing a lot together and we're constantly comparing things. So nothing is a silo. And it's one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning is that it really is important to remember that a heuristic analysis can't be done in a silo. A survey cannot, a poll, interviews, everything has to be matched. So when, I, when we finish performing that heuristic analysis, we will then go back to all the rest of our research and figure out, okay, does this correlate? Is this different than what we've been seeing in other places? Um, how does this work together and how can we use it to optimize the website? Um, at the end of the day, my job is to optimize websites for my clients or help my students optimize their websites. So I do that by kind of aggregating all of that research together and finding those common themes and segments that we can use. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, David Huff says, do you use web content accessibility guidelines? Um, I do for specific websites according to the country that I'm working with. Um, each, as I mentioned before, each country has their own laws and stuff, but we do have uh, strict laws in Israel and in England for accessibility. So you can actually log into even government um, pages and websites to find the laws and accessibility guidelines for your country. So it's just the thing you should check out. Um, unfortunately, there isn't enough content on it, um, on this subject. And I think it is well worth the time to read as much as you can about it. But unfortunately, I can't give you too much information about it myself. Um, okay, those are all the questions in the Q&A box. Let me see if we have, um, if anyone wants to try this and is looking for contributors, I would be interested in doing that. That's awesome, Carl. That's so cool. Um, so Carl is offering to do heuristic analysis with you guys. So that's also awesome to start um, kind of working with each other on analyzing your, your websites. Okay, so um, Sophia, let me know if I missed any questions um, by anyone because the chat is quite full. So I'm not gonna go back because then I'll lose everything, but Hopefully I've answered everyone's questions. So um, as you know, I try to keep um, our workshops really actionable and you now have that spreadsheet. So hopefully this week you can focus on doing it um, on getting started with the heuristic analysis. Remember that if you do it correctly, you can do it with a few hours. So it doesn't require months of planning or even weeks of planning. You can jump straight into it and start doing a heuristic analysis. Um, Next week, we are talking about heat maps. It's going to be really interesting. I've already mapped out the live training, um, and it's going to be all about the mistakes that people make when they're using a heat map and how to basically use heat maps, recordings, um, scroll maps, eye tracking to get meaningful insights about your users. So hopefully, I will see you live here next week. Um, until then, you can, we will be able to find the recording, the slides, um, 
and the spreadsheet on our blog by Friday. And that's it. Until then, thank you everyone so much for logging in. Um, stay awesome and I will see you next week. Bye guys.